As the disease progresses, Glenn Campbell's connection to the world will slowly fade, but audiences are hoping he can keep the line open for a little longer. And I'm doing Every time I watch that, I'm always amazed at all the things he was involved in. I remember the first when I first saw that, if you would have said the words Glenn Campbell, I just thought country music. That's it, and that's all I ever thought. I never knew before I watched that. I had no idea that you're hearing him when you're listening to some of those songs like from Frank Sinatra. It's crazy to think that's him in the background touching on all these different facets of music. Anything stick out from that other than I mean, obviously, it's kind of sad. I mean, if you didn't know, spoiler, he did die about, about a year and a half, two years ago. So he did pass away from the disease. Anything you notice or pop out from that? You don't need to write anything down. How old was Ashley? She was 25. And she started to notice things when? Back in high school. So she started to notice things seven, eight, maybe even nine years ago, changes in her dad that maybe he wasn't aware of. Of course, there's that one where he's he's not aware of what's going on. So um, in the online lecture, I, which is going to be, I said, it's going to be kind of brief, we'll get to what signs and symptoms of things aren't dementia and is not Alzheimer's. Because people, rightfully so, get worried that things they're experiencing, oh my gosh, is this... Is this a sign of dementia or Alzheimer's? And, and the list of things that's not Alzheimer's is, is actually pretty long. So there, there's some natural changes that happen that people, once they know, hey, this is normal, never mind, they don't need to worry. But that is one of the hallmark symptoms of dementia, though, of Alzheimer's, is you, as the person experiencing it, aren't aware that there's a problem. So if you find yourself in moments where you know you're forgetting something or, or what the heck, that's not Alzheimer's, that's not dementia, because you're aware. Someone who actually has dementia has moments where, like what, I have what, I have Alzheimer's? Yes, yes, let's walk through it again. But anyway, before we get into any of that, let's just talk about the brain. So again, this next section, which will take us a couple weeks, just call it this, the brain, all the changes that happen. So before any diseases though, we're just gonna talk about some natural things that happen, and this slide looks confusing, but it's actually full of some good news. There was two basic models about changes that happen inside the brain that people in the field of human development have embraced at some point. The first one is actually one that I learned about when I was sitting in your shoes. I distinctly remember learning about the neuronal fallout model, and that was it. There was nothing after that. The, the neural, this is neuronal. The neural fallout model simply says that, one, you are born with all of the neurons that you're ever going to have. And once your brain matures, which back then we thought was somewhere in your young teens, it's really a, a matter of how long can you hold on to them. Because slowly and surely, neurons start to die inside your brain. That was what we believed. It's, it's actually kind of amazing to think it was just 20 years ago. That was kind of where we were at. You're born pretty much with all your neurons. Once your brain matures, they just kind of slowly wither and die. And we might as well get this term out of the way. Sorry, you're just like in the perfect spot. Neurons do indeed die. And there's a name for that. It's called apoptosis. You're going to see that pop up again and again. You might as well just define it now. And then we'll move on. That doesn't sound too encouraging. And luckily, we've now figured out that that's not accurate at all. Today, we simply embrace something we broadly call neural, the neuroplasticity model. And this is where some good news comes in. Plasticity, of course, we use that word whenever we talk about something that can be changed or molded or evolved because it's plastic and it can bend. 
And it turns out 20 years ago, all that stuff that I learned was completely inaccurate because of two things. The first discovery that we made was that even people in their 80s and 90s can actually produce new neurons. You never lose the capability of neural production. And then we also learned that you also never lose the capability for something called dendritic elaboration, which might sound confusing, but if you just think about what they're saying there, think back to Psych 110 or junior high when you learn the anatomy of an atom, an atom, and a neuron, not an atom. Dendrites, I mean, just for a quick review, what do, what do dendrites do? I don't feel like drawing an atom and going through the different part. Why do I keep calling it an atom, a neuron right now? What's the job of a dendrite? Picture a little neuron, that little cartoon you always see, that stuff coming out. Anyone? Summon it. Dendrites are connections between two neurons. That's how they talk to each other. So that's how neurons in your brain connect. So you need a lot of these. What dendritic elaboration means is that if one dendritic connection gets lost, which does happen, other dendrites can make up for that loss and reconnect it. In other words, imagine if the phone line running to your house gets cut, well, your house has the ability to whip out a new cord and reconnect it in a different way. So the connection still goes through. In fact, someone actually made a good analogy on Monday. You're on your phone and you're in a Wi-Fi hotspot, right? And then you lose the Wi-Fi, but you look down, but the connection's still there because whatever plan you have kicks in, right? Perfect. It's like actually a really good analogy. Kind of the same thing. Dendritic elaboration. Connections don't get lost because neurons are smart enough to make up for it. And we've learned that there's actually a few, well, four actually, four different ways that this happens. And I just use, by all means, we're just going to use the anagrams because it's much easier. The Herald model, the PASA model, the Crunch model, and the Brain Reserve model. But I will tell you what they stand for if you'd like to write them down. Obviously, I have the book in front of me because I can't even remember exactly what it is. So... So what are the different ways that we see dendritic elaboration inside the brain? Well, we'll start with something we simply call Herald. Your book even calls it Herald, but technically it stands for the Hemispheric Asymmetry Reduction in Older Adults Model. Let's just call it Herald. So one way dendritic elaboration happens, Herald, is focus on the H, hemispheres. If you lose something, a capability in your left hemisphere, the right hemisphere has the capability of making up for that. Someone, so what's, what does this mean practically? Well, if someone experiences a stroke that's bad enough, they might lose maybe the ability of their left hand. Well, that's wired somewhere on the right side of their brain. What can happen, though, if they go through rehab, that right side of the brain where that might stay dormant, it might stay dead, those connections are gone, but the left side of the brain can make up for that. So what Harold says is, Damage in one hemisphere can be made up by neurons in the other hemisphere. The PASA discovery, PASA stands for posterior anterior shift of aging. Again, just focus on the first two, posterior anterior. What we've learned is if you get damage in the back of your brain, so think back again to Psych 110, you probably learned about the different lobes. The frontal lobe, of course, is in the front. The occipital lobe is in the back. If there's damage that happens to the rear of the brain, neurons in the front of the brain, where, there's, where they're very plentiful, can start to make up for that. So the first one is side to side. The second one is back to front. And then the crunch model, which stands for the compensation-related utilization of neural circuits hypothesis but we'll just call it crunch. It's also one of my favorite candy bars growing up. That's like, I just love the best of crunch. But anyway, what does this one say? All right, let's say I give you a puzzle to solve, some type of riddle. Here, Dante, solve this riddle. And then I also give that riddle to, let's pretend, I don't know if he does, an 85-year-old grandmother. I give them both the same riddle, and as I give them these, I'm looking at the activity in their brain. 
whose brain is going to light up more? Any guesses? Well, I know it's Dr. Mine, but he's trying to trick us. So I should probably say the one that's not obvious. And if that's actually true, it's actually his Ill older grandmother. The brain active, the brain lights up a little bit more. The crunch model says this. In the brains of older adults become overactive when performing certain activities to help make up for any neural, let's call it loss. The brains in older adults when performing certain activities become overactive to make up for any loss that's happened. In other words, it's almost like the older brain is saying, okay, I'm not sure who's gonna take care of this. I'm just gonna call everyone and someone's gonna pick up the phone. That, that's, the, that's, a, that's another analogy someone made on Monday. That's exactly what we're trying to say. So the brain gets overexcited so that someone's one connection can work on this. Whereas in a younger person's brain, it's a little bit more reliable. So we know we just need to call one person. We know they're going to be there. We know they're going to pick up the phone. And then the brain reserve model, this actually has more to do with neural production. The brain reserve model says that our brains, one reason it keeps producing new neurons is that this one's pretty easy to explain, is so those neurons can get used. If you lose one, and I know this is a weird way to think about neurons and how your brain develops, but neurons inside the brain move, they migrate. You'll learn eventually where they get produced inside the brain. But your brain is almost like a little machine, little factories that produce neurons, and then where it's needed, they can go. And that's what the brain reserve model says. You never lose the ability to produce them. And your brain is very efficient and deciding where they go. I know it says on there are four key changes, but first, but actually we're just going to do the four key changes first, and then we'll see the other thing that we're going to do after that. So this would be, I don't want to really call this bad news, but these are the four changes that are going to happen to you no matter what. So there are four key declines that we see in older people, but I'll probably say this three or four times today. I want you to keep something in mind as we talk about these. These are changes that indeed happen. However, none of these changes are significant enough in a normal, healthy, older person. I don't care if they're 85 or 95. None of these changes are significant enough to cause significant life impairment. Okay, So it's not like just because this is happening, this person now can't do something that they did six weeks ago or six years ago. They can still do it. So under normal healthy conditions, these are just simply changes that happen. All right, the first one happens in your prefrontal cortex. That's what the PFC stands for. The prefrontal cortexes are smaller in older adults. And when I'm talking about older adults, I really mean older, older adults, so 85 plus. The prefrontal cortexes are smaller, so they've it's shrunk a little bit, and they are less active. We see less activity of this. The prefrontal cortex will always kind of remind you what this stuff is for. This is for decision making, sound judgment, rationality. Again, this doesn't mean though the 90-year-old can't make decisions and isn't rational. It just might take a little bit longer. But nothing that's going to cause significant life impairment. I think actually someone on Monday reminded us that, remember Mr. Overton? Was anyone a little bit shocked when he got in his truck and started driving? Like, wait, whoa, 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 wait a second. Are you sure you can even see? Right? So no, it's, you can still do, you can still do things. It just might take a little bit longer. Just like the 104-year-old running the 100-meter dash. It just takes a little bit longer. You can still do it, though. The second is in your temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is on, think of it as the folds on the sides. People often call it the thumb of the brain, right? That's that lobe that's on the side of the brain. It's the lateral side. Now, this is actually related to a very observable, practical change that we see in a lot of older adults. 
the temporal lobe, just like the prefrontal cortex, shrinks, and we see less activity there. What really common observation do we see in older adults that's connected to this? Does anyone know what's in the temporal lobe? Any guesses? If you guess, I can make it stupid joke. No, no one's going to say anything. All right, the audio centers of the brain. The audio centers of the brain are largely here in the temporal lobe. Even though it's stereotypical, do older, older adults have more difficulty hearing? Yes, they do. It's not because they've had like some kind of trauma to their eardrum, it's because of their brain. The audio centers in the brain are just a little slower and less active. So that's another common, normal impairment, let's call it that. I don't know what to call it. The hippocampus. I always love the hippocampus. One of my favorite named parts of the whole body. Overall, in general, the hippocampi, I don't know if that's actually pluralized, like saying that, it sounds good. The hippocampi of older adults is, like the other three, a little smaller, significantly smaller actually, but still very active. We see a lot of activity there. It just looks smaller. And there's two things I want you to write down, and it's okay if you don't know what the first one means yet. We'll get there. Just write it down for now. Two really crucial things the hippocampus is involved for is in encoding information. Again, if you don't know what that is just yet, hold on, you'll know that. It's basically how you learn, but encoding information and also retrieving information. So the hippocampus is all about learning and memory. But for this class, we'll use the terms encoding and retrieval. That's essentially what we're talking about. So learning and memory. So your hippocampus is really important. It helps you learn new things, and of course, it helps you retrieve memory. It does other things, but that's the focus here. Again, enough damage to cause severe impairment? No. In fact, you might be surprised. The online lecture, too, will also include, there's also parts of your memory that actually get better as you get older. A lot of people think it's just all downhill. It's actually not. There's actually some things that actually improve as you enter older, older age. And then finally, last but not least, something a little bit different. Although, if you remember the 90 plus video, remember that little documentary at the end that talked about dementias and Alzheimer's disease? White matter hyperintensities are much more common in older, older adults than they are in someone like yourself. This actually is a picture of white matter. I guess I need to, to back up just for a second so we're all on the same page. Some people probably know, but some people have no clue what we're talking about. What is what is white matter? It's a very specific part of the brain, and we just recently, in the last five or six years, learned how to actually look at it. We always know it's there, but now we figured out a way to actually look at it specifically, and that's 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 inside your head somewhere. It's like spaghetti but spilled on the floor. Any ideas what white matter is? No, no ideas. What's the quickest way to get from Cleveland to Columbus? Probably jump on the interstate, right? I mean, you, there's lots of roads you could take, but we built freeways for a reason, right? But we can connect major cities to major cities to major cities. There's no interstate that goes to Harrisville, Ohio, my hometown, because no one cares, right? But you can. Same one that gets closed, right? So what, what, what white matter is, is like the interstates of your brain. White matter's job is to connect major structures to other major structures. It's how your brain communicates with itself. The frontal lobe is connected to the limbic system via white matter. They're the superhighways of your brain. And if problems happen in your white matter, it means there's just difficulty in one part of your brain talking to another part of your brain. And that can cause things to either slow down or just stop altogether. White matter hyperintensities are essentially, now that we have that analogy in your head, they're essentially like road damage, potholes that appear inside the white matter. Well, these interstates have been used now for 85, 95 years. It's going to happen. 
there's going to be some type of damage, some type of disintegration a little bit, and we call those white matter hyperintensities. Just wear and tear on the interstates of your brain. Again, enough to cause problems and the inability to move your right leg? No. <laughs> just so if you, this is why things maybe take a little bit longer and just slow down a little bit. Because the parts of your brain aren't talking to each other as efficiently as they did when you were 22. Incidentally, um, the, you don't need to write this down, but this ties into that 90 plus documentary. This is actually a question that was on the exam. Oh, by the way, did anyone notice anything maybe peculiar about the exam? Quiz questions? Yeah, the, qu the quiz questions were actually part of your exam. I hope, actually, one person on Monday didn't even pick up on that, but it was like, oh my. <laughs> yeah, so if you didn't know, yeah, the, the quiz made up almost half, not exactly, but. The quiz questions are on there, so make sure you're watching those reviews and things like that. It's actually there to help you. The goal isn't to have you do bad, it's to actually enjoy this stuff. But 90 plus, what, what was the cause of all the dementia that they saw in these older people? Many strokes. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in, the, in when we head back to chapter five. When someone has a, a mini stroke, and the weird thing about those is they usually cause no observable symptoms. You could be having one and not really know. When someone has a mini stroke or a severe stroke, what happens is there's like an electrical storm that happens inside the brain and it actually destroys the white matter. Boom, it's like, a, it's like an asteroid hitting the white matter. Wherever the damage is done is what we observe and what we see in the individual, whatever loss that they have. And of course, over time, if you don't stop a stroke quickly enough, right, it starts eating away and eating away at the white matter. That's, that's what a mini stroke does or a big stroke. That's what causes these in great number, and that's why we see the problem. So four really common changes that happen inside the brain before we get this. Now we need to shift gears just a little bit. Before we talk about dementia or Alzheimer's or what improves and what declines as we get older, we just need to do a basic primer on how your brain works with regards to receiving information, processing information, storing that information, because that's what dementias are all about, right? People become disoriented, they become confused, they lose the ability to learn things, to recognize things. So how does this all function? So once we get this out of the way, then we've kind of opened the door to talk about dementias and Alzheimer's. So this, what are the nuts and bolts of how your brain actually functions? So we'll call this next little mini part, how the brain learns and remembers. This is actually kind of important because that's what dementia is, is a significant impairment in your ability to learn and remember things. This is something called IP theory, it stands for information processing theory. taken from another PowerPoint or another class. Pay no attention to the zero and two. I knew I had this picture somewhere and I found it in a lifespan PowerPoint from something. But anyway, that's basically, there's a lot of stuff up here, but the first thing to write down is you learn and process information in three distinct stages. The first one is something we call sensory memory. That's the first stage, gets the ball rolling. The second is something I'm sure you've heard about, and the third, short-term memory, and then long-term memory. So three distinct stages of how information enters your brain, might get stored and might or might not. How does this process all happen? So we're going to step by step, we'll talk about how this all works, and then we'll play a little game and see if you're normal. Everyone was normal on Monday. Maybe you all will be too. I hope you are. All right, so we'll start here. Sensory memory. What happens? Well, this is literally your five senses. This is how you take in information. You're using all of them right now. Although the fun thing is you're blissfully aware of a lot of it. So your brain is constantly taking in information. Some of it you just don't even pay attention to and disregard, like the noise in the room, right? You're, it's there, but it's not like you're focusing on it. Why would you? But of course, some stuff 
you'd like to think about and focus on, maybe specifically the things that you're learning. So, okay, let's just think of that way. If, if you focus on something, if you start thinking about something and start using that information, then you have successfully transferred it from sensory memory to your short-term memory. And your short-term memory has a nickname I want you to know because your book uses it a lot, and I like it better anyway. We call your short-term memory your working memory. It's kind of weird to think about your short-term memory this way. Your short-term memory is kind of you, in a way. It's your consciousness. Whatever you're thinking about, whatever song is going through your head, whatever you're focusing on, that's your short-term memory. So let's just take a break. Let's let's test your short-term memory a lot because when we talk about problems, well, what's a normal short-term memory? There would be two questions that would be interesting to know. One, how much stuff can we hold in our short-term memory? What's normal? And then how long can it stay there before we forget it, before it goes away? Because if you're hearing something and learning something, the example I always use is imagine you're at a party. I guess this doesn't really happen anymore because now everyone has cell phones and you're just going to text each other. But back in the good old days, let's pretend you're at a party and you see someone and they're really cute and they come up to you and they, uh, and they give you your phone number and they leave. Uh-oh, you got to remember this, right? So how much stuff can you hold up there and how long does it stay? Well, let's, let's test your short-term memory. This is actually very, very easy to do. So what I'd like you to do is just put... I know, I know you, a lot of us are typing, and that's fine. So don't type anything. Um, if you're writing stuff down, don't write anything down. What I'm going to show you is just a series of words. So I'm going to show you 13 of them, actually. And after I show them to you, all I would like you to do is write down as, memory, as many as you can possibly remember in no particular order. So it doesn't matter if they're in the right order or not. Just try to remember as many as you possibly can. All right, I'll give you a, a moment to get out of I brought my art set. <laughs> All right, I gotta adjust this anyway. All right, so no writing down yet. So after I've done showing them to you, then to see how many you can possibly remember. Someone on Monday remembered ten of them. You're scared. And <laughs> I'm in awful. I have no memory and I'm in menopause. <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't here last week, that makes no sense. Anyway, all right, you ready? Okay. The fun thing is, sometimes people remember words that weren't even on there. Oh, oops. Oh. All right, so let's let's see how you did. I guess let me ask it this way: Did anyone not have dog? Because almost everyone. We have a little phenomenon that happens that might seem obvious. Most people remember a lot from the beginning. 
they remember a lot from the end, but when we get to the middle, that's where things just get really fuzzy. But so did anyone not have dog? How about pickle? Did we? You forgot pickle? Yeah. Wow. All right, so we're losing two right there. Girl. That was the H word. Oh. You got 10? You got 8? Anyone beat 10? And 11. There's, there's, always, there's always some outliers. So here's what normal is. If, did anyone remember less than 5? Put it that way. Okay, great. So we're all in the normal range. So the norm, we actually know what the normal range for an adult is. And by the way, there's factors that could impair you, like how much caffeine you've had. Did you have a horrible night's sleep, right? So if, right, so if you're on the low end, it's, it's probably okay, right? If you're in college and you do things you probably should do half the time. But five to nine, anywhere from five to nine is considered normal. So whenever you hear of someone taking like a cognitive test, this is actually a basic test. And actually in some of the stuff we'll watch for Alzheimer's, this is a basic cognitive test they give to people to see if their short-term memory is functioning properly. They'll simply say, all right, I'm gonna give you five words. And then they kind of talk about something else for a little bit. And they say, remember those five words I asked you to remember? What were they? Right? And then they'll, they'll see if they can remember them. So five to nine is your normal capacity. Remember, think of it like balls that you can juggle. And 30 seconds. 30 seconds is the average time that you have before. I always think of Back to the Future when things start to fade. I don't know if you've even seen those movies. But anyway. 30 seconds is about how long you have before stuff starts to fade, like crumble. So now there's things that you can do, of course, to keep it inside your head, right? If someone says, here, remember this phone number, you can just keep reciting it all day long and you can keep something up there for 24 hours. But if you don't do anything, what, what we're saying is if you don't do anything to try to keep that information in there, it's going to start to fade away and then it's going to just kind of implode. And this explains why on an almost daily basis, I have an idea like, oh, there's something I would like to get from our pantry. So I walk to our pantry. But along the way, I have little children. And things happen like, Daddy, I want some spaghetti. I was like, Daddy, can I have that? Well, what, 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 what? And then I get to the pantry and I open the door. And I say, why in the hell am I in the pantry? I know I'm here for a reason, but I have no idea what it is. Because I had an idea I was focused on and I got distracted. And by the time I got there, I said, what the hell? Do I have Alzheimer's? No, I have children. Um, which actually have the same impact. Does it matter what words you use? Like, is that thing? It actually does. To do this correctly, you need to have words that aren't necessarily like telling a story or connected. Like, like if you just did countries, China, Japan, like, so you're supposed to use words that are don't really necessarily have a natural connection. Like, which is kind of hard to do. I mean, I but I tried to pick ones that, even though I look at this, like, well, there's a jar of paint, right? That's what I'm. Yeah. Who knows? But anyway. You got pizza in your hair, whatever it is. Out of curiosity, so now back to aging, really quick. What did what did you do to try to remember these? Just out of curiosity, like what technique did you use? Uh, I like tried to relate them. Well, that's good. So you're like trying to tell a story. Okay. Anyone do anything different? I just try to remember. You just try to remember, like. Right I was just so, the letters. I would like to see it. You what? I would like to see it and repeat it back myself. So, okay. Like, Very common. So, so far what I hear, so there's really two major ways that your hippocampus helps you do this, or your short-term memory. What I'm hearing from you guys is this, the phonological loop. If, you, if you're telling yourself a story, if you're trying to relate them to one another, that your phonological loop is when you try to recite something again and again and again. Like if someone said, remember these last four numbers, five, six, very important. Or you'll walk around all day, 5685. You're trying to remember the code for whatever it is. That's your phonological loop. But there's another way to do this, and it's called your visuospatial sketch pad, which someone on Monday, when I asked it, he actually said, This is what I did. 
And the reason this is important for aging, a lot of times when I teach this class, it didn't happen this semester, but I usually have someone older, like from Copeland Oaks, taking the class because they're just interested. And the best guy was a guy named Peter. On this test, Peter would usually get 11 or 12 every single time. In fact, when he got 12 once, the class thought I had planted him. And he was like, no, he really did this. The, the important thing is, as we get older, something happens. When we reach like 65 plus, we stop using this, and we start using this a lot more, the visuospatial sketch pen. And it's a lot more effective. Older adults use, typically outperform younger adults on these tests, okay, barring any type of disease or anything like that. And it's not because their short-term memory has gotten better. It's because the techniques they use to try to remember things have improved. But some, I can't remember his name, sits right there. He actually did this. What, what does this mean? What was, what's the better technique to try to do this? Let me go back to the words. This is exactly what Peter used to say. And it's exactly what the kid did on Monday. The kid. So how this works is like this. What Peter would say is, whenever I'm given a test like this, and he, you can apply this to different aspects of your life, because how often do you take a cognitive test in a psych class, right? Maybe once in your life. But he always he's like, I picture my, my memory as a blank canvas. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint a picture. And the first thing he paints on that canvas is a dog. And then the dog is eating a pickle. And there's a girl standing behind the dog. And she has really, really long, obnoxiously long hair. She's eating a piece of pizza. And she's also talking on the phone at the exact same time. And there's a really big rat that's right behind her, and she doesn't know that it's there. He's drawing a picture inside his head. And then when I say, hey, remember, all he has to do is look at that picture and write down everything that he sees inside the picture. And before you know it, you've got a really long list because he turned 13 chunks of things into one chunk. And all he has to do is look at that one chunk and be able to remember it. This is why... Like area codes, like right, if you're from like 330, like right, okay, that's just a given. Like that's, you don't even need to remember that because that's, whew, that's one chunk that's over there. I don't need to remember it. So, anyway, does that make sense? So, you're short short. Remember everything. Okay. Yeah. See, there you go. Like. <laughs> no problem. So, yeah, but it is, it's a weird phenomenon. Older adults kind of stop using the phonological loop, but younger people seems to be like the only thing, like the most common way that people try to do this is just to simply keep repeating them. But that's like a, I mean, it works for most things, but what happens is that list just gets too damn long. Uh, we're, you're, you're trying to remember too many chunks that even a superior short-term memory can't do. I've never met anyone who has done 13. 12 and 11 have popped up a couple times, but even that is rare. Okay, watch, I'm actually, well, I'll just keep this up. So that's your short-term memory. Well, what about your long-term memory? In fact, one of the videos you're going to watch is going to introduce you to a guy. Well, it's like a cartoon, so you're not really going to see him. Maybe next week I'll actually show you him, because there's a lot of good videos on him. A guy that suffered from one of the worst cases of amnesia ever reported. His name is Clyde Weary. Amnesia, of course, is a problem with your, like something's going wrong with retrieval, right? Well, more on that later. So your long-term memory, if... Like learning, I mean, you're in college studying for an exam. One of your goals, you always want to take it from here to here, right? You hope you successfully, I'm learning it now. I hope it's getting stored back there so that I can retrieve it at some point. So your long-term memory. This is actually a good chance to give you that word, encoding. You wrote it down before. Encoding means you successfully transferred information from one stage of your memory to another stage of your memory. And it's not on that, just, I don't know why it's not on here. Everyone just take a second and become conscious of the noise that the heating system is making. You just encoded that. You just took it from your sensory registers to your short-term memory because you're, you're thinking about it. If you successfully learn something, if you put it from your short-term memory to your long-term memory, you've encoded that information. So encoding just means from one place to the next. Coding, encoding. So your long-term memory. A lot of people have no idea how complex and how different your long-term memory is. It usually gets presented, like in a cartoon, like maybe inside out. Your long-term memory gets presented and thought of as like a giant warehouse, right? 
you just got a bunch of stuff and someone asks you a question and some little guy like, runs back to the warehouse and tries to look it up and find the information and bring it back and then you remember it, right? That's one way to think about that. And for a long time, that's what we thought. The long-term memory is just, your, it's just a giant warehouse. It turns out that warehouse is actually an incorrect representation. There is a warehouse. There's just other things, too. So over here, while you're watching Glenn Campbell, I was doing some drawing. So your long-term memories. There are two, two fundamental different types of long-term memory. So it's not just one thing. That's why we see the two branches. There is something that we call explicit long-term memory, which is the branches that go in that direction is typically what most people think of when they think of long-term memory. But there's also something called implicit long-term memory. Two very distinct types of long-term memory, explicit and implicit. Anyone know what separates these two? It's kind of on there what the CR stands for. What separates these two kinds? By the way, Clyde Weiring's amnesia is so bad, he can't even remember what food tastes like. Like he orders, he'll get, go to a restaurant, like, do I like chicken? What, is, what does chicken even mean? Like a salad? What he has, he's lost the ability, but... He can sit down and play the piano. What? How is that possible? Like, how do you? So, in other words, but once you understand this, I think you'll understand how that is possible. Conscious recall. That's what the CR stands for. Conscious recall, or conscious recall, means effort. You had to try. What's the capital, anyone? What's the capital? I want everyone to try to, so who can answer me first. What's the capital of California? Oh, shit. That's okay, we can actually stop. Because I know what's happening inside your brain. That little guy, right? He ran back to your warehouse and he found the box. It's state capitals. Crap, state capitals. Let's see, California. I don't know. Damn it. It's at Sacramento. But of course, you might have thought of that. But you were trying. The reason I just wanted to do that is you can feel it, right? That's conscious recall. If you're trying to remember something, in other words, what we're saying is explicit takes effort. Implicit is automatic. It's on auto. It's on autopilot. But we'll get to that. Like, what? what does this mean? How are some memories on autopilot? All right. So there are two types of explicit long-term memory. That's why we see two branches going off on that one. If you can't read it, maybe you can. The first type is called semantic. Semantic explicit long-term memory. This is what makes you good at trivial pursuits, or Jeopardy, or even most of public education. Semantic memory is, is simply facts. It's all the stuff that you know. What's the Pythagorean theorem? How do you find the area of a circle? Sorry, these are examples I'm thinking of because I currently have a seventh grader in math, and I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning all this stuff that I knew. I learned it at some point, right? But I've forgotten all of it. It's back there somewhere. So semantic, that's just all the stuff you know. What's the capital of Georgia? Whatever it is. So semantic, and for most people, this is what they think of as long-term memory, right? Just the stuff that I know. Well, there's a different type of explicit long-term memory, and it's called episodic. Everyone just take a moment. I want you to think, picture in your mind, your, the best birthday you ever had. Maybe it was last week. Who was last week? <laughs> right, so you're thinking of a memory, right? A personal memory? At least you're trying. <laughs> Damn it, that's very big old shitty. If you're thinking, like, play it back in your head. What happened? Where were you? Where was your mom? Maybe your sister? That's called episodic, explicit long-term memory. So episodic is personal. It's what's happened to you. It's like you're running a recorder of your life. It turns out those are two very they're stored in two very different ways and two very different places.
So that's explicit long-term memory. Can I pick on you for a second, Dante? You're sitting here. I'd like you to, you could just get up, walk to the wall, touch the wall, and come back. And everyone, everyone to focus on his walking and rate it. How good is he at walking? <laughs> this is Dante. He's very Calvin Klein. <laughs> very good. Would you? That's like a ten, right? Did you see any problems with his walking? Is that weird? <laughs> like now they're walking. Yeah. Have you ever, so when you when you walk, were you thinking about moving your legs or your? I was thinking about curve. Well, we don't curve, right? <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever watched a little kid try to walk for the first time? It's really hilarious. And you can see it, you can kind of see it in their mind. They're, they're, they're like going, they're like, oh God. All right, first I need to lift this. And my, my older one, she's now 13. It took her forever. She was like 13 months and still not walking. Not because she couldn't do it, because she, she could not get it in her head to bend her freaking knees. Like, and we'd even tell her, like, bend, bend your knee. And then she would try and go, I'm pregnant tonight. And just like fall <laughs> over. Like, but you can see it in her head. Why didn't you think about that? Why, why don't, when you get out of your chair, why don't you think, like, all right, here we go again. All right, left leg. Perfect. Right leg. Oh, yeah, yeah. now we're going. Like, or do you just do it? Of course, you just do it. Has anyone here ever tried to drive a stick ship or learn how to drive it? That remember that first moment? It's great, isn't it? You have no idea what you're doing, and you think I'm never going to get this. But someday you realize it's just automatic, and it's like hey, you've always done this. That's what we call procedural implicit long-term memory. We don't really think about it this way, but you learn how to do that, right? You know how to walk. You know how to ride a bike. You know how to eat. You just do. But you this is stuff you had to learn. You're not born knowing how to drive a stick shift. But at some point, it becomes automatic. You don't think about it. You just do it. There's no conscious recall. It's just like you're on autopilot. And we call this procedural implicit long-term memory. Which, by the way, is a big key into Clive and how he's able to play the piano. But I'll let you watch more of the story on your own. And then there's this other part. Anyone have any police in their family, like cops? No? So I've been pitching this idea for a decade, because I've been teaching about this for a decade. And to my knowledge, no one has ever done it. But if if we really, 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 really cared about not people or not having people speed on our highways. I have the perfect idea, and here's what it is. I'm gonna guess that we have a lot of cop cars that are just not used anymore. Would you guess I'm like they just they just they're older or whatever it is, or just some that just aren't. And it doesn't matter really how old they are. Every single time if I could be on cruise control, like let's say the speed limit's 70, we're flying down the interstate, and I've got the cruise control set on 72, or so nothing to worry about, right? If I even see, and this is all based off a series of experiences that happened when I'm younger that I'm not going to get into, but if I even see like something that resembles a cop coming towards me, like don't you always love it when you're driving and you see a car coming and you know it's a, you know, and you slow down, but then it like a, some guy with like a luggage rack, like, damn it, it wasn't even a cop. If I even see like a hit and we're on cruise control, and instinctively I like, I hit I hit the brake and like my and my wife, Aah! she's trying to slap me. The kids are in slow motion. Why bother? Because it's conditioned. I've always thought the best, if you wanted to stop speeding, you know those little gaps in the interstate that says don't go here unless you're an emergency vehicle? Take old cop cars and just sit them there. And randomly, throughout the interstates, no one would speed ever because no one would have any idea, is that a real one or a fake one? Is there a cop in there or not? You wouldn't know because it's my little trap and my little trick. And people like me, would never even think about speeding because yeah, I'm conditioned. And so the, uh, the last, so we, we end up with four different types of long-term memory. And the last one is called conditioned implicit long-term memory. This is where we're all different. We all have different things we're conditioned to, these automatic responses to stimuli in the environment. For me, one of them is seeing a cop car and hitting the brakes, no matter what. And it's not even if you know you're Yeah, no, it, it, it doesn't, I could be, if I see a cop, I'm not even in a car, a cop comes towards me, I'm like, what are you doing? Nothing. 
<laughs> no, it's just, it's automatic. I can't stop it. And then you say something genius, like, why did you do that? I don't know. That's brain damage. All right, we good? So, kind of talk about the basics of changes that happen in your brain and then how your memory functions on a, on a basic level. All right, well, that's it. I'm going to hit end stream.